so hi and welcome everyone first of all i welcome all of you for uh, gathering today on this uh, noble quest for learning uh, so today's uh, first class is with shri vgk kanta sir and uh, this class uh, through this class uh, we will be uh, trying to uh, understand the six <coughs> schedule to the constitution of india with special reference to meghalaya now before we start the class and before i take up too much time uh, with everything i would want to most humbly uh, introduce sir to everyone so sir is a senior advocate who is practicing before the honorable meghalaya high court uh, sir is also the ex president of the shillong high court bar association he is fondly known as bab diwan so have i pronounced it correctly sure so and sir belongs to the khasi community uh, so that's what makes this class even more relevant along with that sir is presently the special counsel of khasi hills autonomous district council earlier sir has held various positions some of which uh, are uh, he was the vice chairman of meghalaya state law commission he has also been uh, an independent member of meghalaya state security commission sir is also member of advisory board of the meghalaya preventive detention act and uh, again lots of other things to be shared about we will try to uh, share everything in detail uh, on our website but right now uh, with respect to the paucity of time i hand i humbly hand this class over to sir and sir we welcome you uh, with uh, very uh, humble hearts and and we grateful to you for taking this time out today. well uh, good morning everybody especially to keshav sharma for having uh, given me this opportunity to uh, deliberate on the sixth schedule to the constitution of india at a very outset i think all of us are aware what is a sixth schedule to the constitution of india uh, in order to understand or know the sixth schedule we have to go to part 10 of the constitution of india that is article 244 by article 244 clause 2 the provisions of the sixth schedule shall apply to the administration of the tribal areas in the state of assam meghalaya tripura and mizoram all of us are aware of uh, the the scheme of the sixth schedule sixth schedule we will notice that the sixth schedule is some sort of a mini constitution all the prerequisites of the constitution of india is there in this six schedule it is some sort of a uh, the, the three golden pillar of democracy is in existence or there in the six schedule we have the, the another six schedule we have the power of uh, we have the executive we have the judiciary and we have the legislature also first and foremost uh, in uh, before coming to the as to how the six schedule came to be uh, to be formed or to be framed or to be carved out we have to give thanks to the gopinath bordoloi committee well uh, i will have to also say that uh, the the members of that committee that is our reverence shri j j m nicol stroy he was one of the architect who understands our the ethos of the khasi society the tribal society and we have to give thanks also to shri rupnath brahma mr av thakar and shri mayang nakcha who i mean later replaced by one mr aliba imti now the the framing of the six rule will have to be attributed to this subcommittee headed by gopinath bordoloi as his chairman and there are four members who, whose name i have already indicated just now <clears throat> how the six schedule came to be framed we have to go back down memory, memory lane we cannot forget that there are number of khasi independent states in the khasils with elected chiefs and darbar running the affairs of the state and before the advent of the british era before the these uh, independent states are running the administration though the british did not subjugate subjugate 
the Kasi states in the strict sense of the term, they had, however, some hold over them through treaties and agreements, offering them protection, and in return, they were offered land to set up their administrative headquarters in the hills to oversee the administration of both the Brahmaputra Valley in the north and Sarma Valley in the south. <clears throat> Though the British remained in these hills for more than a century, they left the Khasi chieftains both hostile and neutral in uninterfered exercise of their authority in their respective territories. Now, they abstained from imposing any taxation on the Khasis, and for all practical purposes, the Khasi territories were held to be beyond the borders of the British India, except for a few pockets, particularly in the southern parts of the Khasis, declared as British cedarships. In these cedarship, which in most cases comprising of one or two villages, the British appoint a cedar chosen from local residents as revenue officials. Now, before I continue further, I would like to uh, thanks the founding fathers of the constitution who recognize the dynamic and vibrant democratic system of administration of the traditional and customary institutions of the hills areas of the then composite state of Assam. As such, they framed the sixth schedule for setting up of autonomous district councils for the purpose, purposes of protecting these traditional institutions to enable the tribal people of the Northeastern region to grow according to own traditions, culture, and genius. The sixth schedule does provide a mechanism for the hill people of the region to legislate, adjudicate, and regulate the traditional, traditional social, cultural, and economic development of their society in a manner which is conducive to such traditions, customs, practices, and conventions, whilst accelerating the pace of their socio-economic development. Now, <clears throat> before I continue with the sixth schedule to the Constitution of India, I would like to inform the viewers, the audience, that uh, originally there are five 25 Khasi states. There are 25 Khasi states by some sort of promises. They were codes, they were uh, forced rather to sign the instrument of accession. The 25 Khasi states, they had executed the instrument of accession and this was executed on 17th day of August 1948, before the constitution came into force. Now, alongside the instrument of accession, there is an agreement executed by the Federation of Khasi States. The Federation of Khasi States, herein to refer as the Federation, agrees that all the existing administrative arrangements between the dominion of India and the province of Assam on the one hand, and the Khasi States on the other hand, shall with the exceptions noted below. That is, when we look at this uh, tenets in this covenants, uh, in the instrument of accession, we will notice that when it comes to the judiciary, the Khasi states will retain upon itself. So far, the judiciary is concerned. And so far, the uh, administration of justice is concerned among the tribals living within the Khasi states. Now, in so far, excise, forests, and land, water rights, and revenue derived therefrom shall be retained with the Khasi states. Now, this was the, uh, the original tenets or covenants that was agreed upon when the instrument of accession was signed. Now, for all purpose, the 25 Khasi states have executed an instrument of accession, meaning thereby that 
they have not merged with the dominion of india it is so important to remind one and all that we have executed the instrument of accession not the instruments of major the <clears throat> now the instrument of accession is crystallized into the six schedule to the constitution of india the tenets the covenants which is uh, agreed upon will find will find visible in the six schedule to the constitution of india now if you look to the six schedule to the constitution of india uh, when it was first uh, enacted will notice that the laws passed by the district councils has got overriding powers even the state laws will not be applicable and even central laws it has to be make uh, it has to be uh, there has to be a special uh, uh, notification to that effect to make it applicable to the tribal areas now <clears throat> when we look at the six schedule to the constitution of india we'll notice that there are there are provisions for constitutions of courts that is you can find it in paragraph 4 of the six schedule to the constitution of india now the regional council or the district council can set up village courts and courts for trial of suits and cases arising between the shield tribe residents of that particular autonomous district council now in meghalaya we have got three autonomous district councils that is the khasils originally it was united khasi jantia autonomous district council now it, it became into two it was bifurcated into two in the year 1964 Um, then uh, the united khasi and jande hills autonomous district council became khasi hills autonomous district council and jante hills autonomous district council and and in the other part in the garo hills we have got the garo hills autonomous district council now when we look at the six schedule to the constitution of india we will find that paragraph 3 paragraph 3 are subjects where the district council can make laws these laws can come into effect after the assent of the governor now we'll find that the 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 district councils can make law within the parameters of the six schedule and nothing beyond it meaning thereby that the the district council do not have plenary powers the supreme court in the case of uh, uh, district council versus uh, city mon sawyan has a uh, Uh, held that the district council do not have plenary powers unlike state legislature or parliament now be that as it may the subjects which are enumerated in the six schedule are very akin with the seven schedule to the constitution of india now <clears throat> we have got the parameters for law making up in so far land is concerned in so far village administration is concerned in so far uh management uh, and so far uh, allotment occupation or use or setting a part of land etc management of any forest not being a reserve forest the use of any canal or water course for a purpose of agriculture the regulation of the practice of jhum or other forms of shifting cultivation the establishment of village or town committees etc thereafter any other matter relating to village or town administration including village or town police and other health and sanitation the appointment or succession of chief or headman the inheritance of property marriage and divorce social customs i would have to admit that yes the district council in so far castles autonomous district council is concerned they have made laws so far the appointment of chief and headman act uh, headman is concerned which uh, flows from paragraph 3 1g of the six schedule now there are other laws forest laws which the district council have uh, also passed uh, the forest so far forest is concerned it, it is attached to the earth because land land it was already covenant that it will be retained with these khasi states now if you look at the uh, the forest 
covers in Meghalaya, there is an affidavit filed with the government of Meghalaya in the case of that Goda Verman case that 95% of forest is under the control and jurisdiction of the Autonomous District Council in Meghalaya. So we will notice also that uh, the district council have made efforts to make law on so far social custom is concerned. Now there are other subjects which the district council are yet to make laws. To me, I feel that the autonomy that is agreed upon, it is existed in the six schedule to the constitution of India. We are supposed to have, uh, we, we, it is known as Cassie Hills Autonomous District Council. We are supposed to have a complete autonomy in so far forest is concerned, land is concerned, excise, and in so far, uh, the adjudication of, I mean, dispensation of justice. But slowly, all these powers and laws are slowly getting eroded. Originally, when the uh, six schedule was uh, enacted, it, it appears that we have complete, the complete autonomy. So far, lawmaking is concerned. So far, the laws passed by the district council. After the coming of the act of, I mean, after the uh, coming into being of the state of Meghalaya uh, in 1971, under the Northeastern Reorganization Act, we will find that uh, paragraph 12A has been inserted. Originally, there was only paragraph 12. Now, after coming of the state of Meghalaya, after formation of the state of Meghalaya, we will find and notice that paragraph 12 a has been amended, meaning that uh, all laws by district council, passed by district council, in, in the event of contravention or in the event of, um, what do you call it, uh, uh, to the extent of repugnancy shall remain, I mean, void, meaning that the state law will have a variating effect. If the state law is in conflict with the district council laws, the district council laws to that extent will not be applicable. It will become repugnant. Now, this is a scenario that we are having now. With this amendment of 12A, where the state laws have got a variating effect over district council laws, this is going against the tenets and agreement signed in the instrument of accession. Now, it is so important for all of us to understand that we have executed the instrument of accession and there is certain agreement, covenants that we have agreed upon that it shall be retained with the Khasi states. Now the Khasi states are, uh, are somewhat, if you read the, uh, the uh, what do you call it, the first schedule to the constitution of India, you'll find that the Khasi states are autom automatically merged with the state of Assam. I mean, uh, those who are frequented with uh, paragraph uh, uh, with this first schedule to the constitution of India will notice that, uh, will notice that, <clears throat> will notice that the Khasi states are merged with the state of Assam right from the very inception, even though we have executed the instrument of accession. Now, the, in so far the paragraph four, when we read paragraph four to the sixth schedule to the constitution of India, we will notice that the lawmakers, the framework of the sixth schedule were very clear in their mind that in, that for trial of suits and cases arising between members of the Shul tribe shall be tried exclusively by court created under this paragraph to the exclusion of any other court. But this interpretation of the six schedule of the paragraph four of the six schedule is being diluted from time to time. Slowly, slowly, we find that the, all these covenants that we have agreed upon all these laws which are there in the six schedule are being getting eroded by state law, by central laws. Now, it is so important that, uh, that uh, those who are acquainted with our customs and tradition, that we stand up and fight for our right, saying that 
these agreements, this covenant that we've been having all along should continue. It should sustain. It should carry on. That uh, lately there has been or there have been some school of thoughts that uh, in view of the fact that the entire state of Meghalaya is categorized as a tribal area under the Sikh schedule, meaning that the Sikh schedule is applicable in the entire state of Meghalaya, except few pockets, which are which uh, are called normal area or municipality of Shalom. So those who are acquainted with the Panchati right system of uh, uh, administration of governance will notice that this part nine, part nine to the constitution of India, that is the 73rd amendment has been exempted in its application to the tribal areas that you'll find in uh, paragraph four, 243, <clears throat> 243. Yes. <clears throat> well, I miss it somewhere, but anyway, uh, Part nine of the Constitution of India has been uh, exempted from its application. That is Article 243M. Part not to apply to certain areas. It is very clear that in areas where there is six schedule, where the six schedule is applicable, the part nine of the Constitution of India, that is a Panchayati Raj system of administration or governance shall not be applicable. Now we'll notice that part nine A also is not applicable. Part 9A is concerning the municipalities. Now, by virtue of uh, Article 243ZC, this part also will not be applicable. Now, when we look at the, the six schedule, it is a complete code in itself. Now, the provisions, the law, the powers that we have, that the district council have been given to make laws, that is under paragraph three, Paragraph six, paragraph eight, and paragraph ten should not be should not be diluted by state laws or central laws. That is uh, one point that I am uh, finding that uh, we must uh, move on and see that this uh, covenant that we agreed upon in 1948 should not be diluted. Should not be diluted at all. And uh, well, there are some school of thought, like I have said earlier who says that uh, the, when the entire state of Meghalaya, when we have got our own state, the district council is no more relevant. Well, <clears throat> well uh, I will have to dispute that point because it is of these covenants that we agreed upon in 1948, the instrument of accession, that uh, the district council in another form has come into being. So if that is the case, that we, we now believe and trust that the district council is an institution to protect our land, our forests, our custom, our social customs, law of inheritance, whatever concerning the custom, concerning uh, of the khasis should be retained, should be maintained. State laws should not, under any circumstances, override district council laws. That is what I feel should be the the government of the day should acknowledge. And uh, <clears throat> as I have uh, submitted earlier, stated earlier, that uh, under the Sikh schedule, we have the autonomous district councils. So we have got three autonomous district councils in the entire state of Meghalaya. Now these autonomous, under the autonomous district councils, we have got the three pillars of democracy. That is the legislative wing, the executive and the judiciary. Now all these three wings are functioning independently. There is no interference from the executive committee in so far the judiciary is concerned. Now the judiciary is being manned by qualified by qualified officers or judicial officers who have, who have come, who are from law background. 
all of them are uh, law graduates. They were law graduates. They were practicing lawyers. They have joined the judiciary, uh, which is called the district council court. Now, so the district council court, by virtue of paragraph five of the six rule, are, I mean, the, the judicial officers were conferred powers to try suits and cases. In so far, criminal cases concerned five years and above, they are being conferred upon the district council courts. Meaning that the when you read paragraph four and paragraph, it has, you have to read paragraph five together. It has to be read together in conjoint, conjoint reading of both the provisions. Now we cannot read paragraph five in isolation. So the, the source for paragraph five is paragraph four. Now, in fact, uh, only at this stage, only I can come to the conclusion. I don't want to continue any further. Uh, we have got the constitution of courts, which I'll, in my next session, perhaps I will be able to elaborate. So this is just a candid discussion uh, as I've indicated earlier that uh, the sixth schedule to the constitution of India has been crystallized by virtue of the instruments of accession executed by the five uh, Khasi states with the dominion of India. Now, at this stage, uh, I would like to leave it to the host in case the host wants to ask some questions. Um, so, so first of all, thank you so much. Uh, it was a very uh, enlightening uh, session, and as you said, sir, that uh, it's again it's a very uh, elaborate topic and just cannot be covered uh, in one particular uh, session itself. So, uh, sir, uh, first of all, I would like to uh, uh, thank you so much and congratulate you for uh, covering such a vast topic, and that too, uh, with respect to all pointers that you have uh, uh, brought it up to. So, uh, uh, so broadly, just one question that I personally have, uh, and in the meanwhile, I'll request everyone to kindly just share whatever questions you have that may be asked, otherwise I'll only keep asking. So, so just one question that I have that, uh, so uh, again, and we're just discussing, sir, from an academic perspective and that too, uh, with respect to so much experience that you have uh, uh, with respect to uh, the sick schedule and the administrative setup uh, alongside it. Uh, so, uh, do you think personally that there is any need to revisit the uh, constitutional structure in this respect? Uh, I am of the view that uh, the original intention of the framework of the constitution is that to give complete autonomy to the tribals, meaning that uh, so far the tribals under the then state of Assam, now of course we have got the state of Meghalaya, that uh, we have to, the constitutional makers, I mean the parliamentarians will have to deliberate on this point that the autonomy which was promised to the Khasi states must be respected, must be respected. And I think that uh, the sixth schedule to the constitution of India must have it requires a revisit. There has to be amendment. Because in the when we look at the autonomous district council, it is a composition of different political parties. The original concept of district council is to have a partyless system of democracy, of governance. Now it is not partyless. Different political parties are in the fray. If that is the case, we will notice that there are so many defections from one political party to another for their self-interest, for their own self-benefit. Now, we, at one point of time, the district council, I mean, the, especially the Khasil's Autonomous District Council, they had passed an anti-defection law. And uh, uh, ironically, it was me who had uh, gone to the high court and challenged the, the said law. Uh, the then chief executive member, Mr. Ishasala, was uh, disqualified. We had challenged that law on a, on the a ground, on the ground that it is not within the parameters of the sixth schedule. Now, where it is provided 
that you must have an anti-defection law uh, akin to the 10 schedule. So what I'm trying to say is that uh, the six schedule requires to be revisited. It has to be amended. Perhaps this anti-defection law has to be inserted in the six schedule. And to my mind, uh, I feel that paragraph 12A, which is uh, presently in existence, and I have that also has to be relooked. The district council laws cannot be overridden by state laws, to my mind. I feel that we should give some uh, importance to all these uh, covenants that we have agreed upon land, forest, and law on social customs, law on, uh, I mean, various laws which have been uh, enacted under the six schedule to the constitution of India. So, uh, so again, very. So you have been there. Uh, you have seen the entire law in progress. You have been actively uh, participating with respect to the uh, development of the law. Uh, if I may uh, take the liberty to say, so, so with that respect, also uh, there is this question. Uh, all right, sir. I'll ask my question in a bit. There is this question uh, uh, which has come up uh, from Mr. Evija uh, Elzer uh, Chulai. So, would you want to ask the question by yourself? <clears throat> so, all right, I will ask the question on their behalf. The question is why is the law passed by the district council took time to be assent by the governor? Uh, normally, any, when we when we look at the autonomous district councils, it is supposed to be autonomous. The state government cannot treat uh, the the district council as a younger brother. It, uh, I mean to say that the, the the state government cannot act as a big brother so far the law passed by the district councils are concerned. Now any law by this uh, passed by the district council are forwarded, should be forwarded normally to the governor's secretariat. And it is the primary duty of the governor to give assent to that law or bill passed by the district council. But in this case, it is not happening. The governor is uh, going by acting on the aid and advice of the, 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 the cabinet, the, gov the state government. And it's, I, mean, I mean to say that the governor is still acting in the a, under the aid and advice of the cabinet. What I'm trying to say that so far district council um, laws are concerned. I think the governor has got independent in coming to a conclusion. Here, the the boss of the district council at the end of the day is the governor. So for the state government, it is the governor. I do agree, but so far the law passed by the district council, it should be a Sent it immediately until until it is subjected to judicial scrutiny. In this case, the the law the bill passed by the district council have been pending for years together because of this step motherly treatment by the state government. I am of the view that the uh, the 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 member of legislative assembly must be aware of all these uh, covenants that we, we've been having in 1948. And they must uh, know that we must, uh, they must show more importance to the district council. The, this, the, state, the state have got its own uh, duty and it can make law in terms of uh, this, the state list and the union list, concurrent list. So far union list is parliament. They can make law so far concurrent list is concerned and the state list is concerned as mandated under schedule seven. But I feel that uh, there is some difficulty, some problem is arising in the Autonomous District Council of Meghalaya when the state government is interfering in its day-to-day -day functioning of the district council. I think that answers Mr. Shulai's question. So, um, so again, sir, um, so I'll, sir, just, I'll just continue with uh, the trail of thought that I was at. Um, so, sir, again, since that you have seen the development of the law so far, 
sir in today's respect in uh, since what was made at the time uh, by the framers of the constitution and where we are today and again uh, many amendments have been made to the constitution with respect to uh, changes uh, that have been felt that they are required in today's world sir uh, so far sir first of all i'll break my question so far what what are the advantages versus the disadvantages of the six schedule so what are the advantages or what are the benefits uh, or maybe what are the costs which uh, versus the cost which the state has had to pay so far I, I don't think I'm clear with the question. You just can repeat it again. All right, sir. Sir, my question is that with since the uh, special provision, uh, the special uh, powers which have uh, been vested with the uh, state of Meghalaya with respect to the sixth schedule, sir, uh, the, what are the advantages, if any, that have been felt by the people <clears throat> of the state of Meghalaya? With respect to, sir, as you said that uh, there are provisions or there are uh, individual cultural heritage which needs to be protected. Uh, there is, uh, again, there is forest land that needs to be uh, uh, looked at from a particular aspect. And howsoever, sir, it has been, uh, I'm just trying to, sir, again, this is just uh, wanting to figure out whether if uh, there is some actual and true advantage which has been felt. Um, well, and so far the succession of chief and headman, the chief means the the head of the Khasi states, chief, same, we call them same. And so far the, the traditional uh, Dorbar, Dorbar Shno, that is at the village level, we have uh, this uh, crystallized, the system of grassroots governance. Starting at the bottom, we have the, the Dorbar Shno, that is the, the village, we call it a village. We have a village headman, we call it Rambar Shno. Then the, at the higher, level we have the same or the chief or the wahadada that is at the intermediate level then thereafter we have the district councils so when we talk about this grassroots governance the the district council is in a better footing to control these grassroots governance these traditional bodies these traditional institutions now because uh, the panchati raj system of governance is not applicable to these areas Perhaps the state government must respect these traditional bodies and traditional customs and tradition that we've been having. It must respect. And I feel that it is to our advantage that the Sikh schedule and the district council retained its original stature. When the, when the, when the Sikh schedule, as it was first enacted, thereafter there was some dilution. I feel that we should go back to the Sikh schedule when it was first enacted, there we have got more uh, more importance, more, uh, I mean, uh, our position, the district council were in a higher position, higher plate. And uh, of course, the, we believe and trust that the district council will do its duties and job to preserve the forest, to preserve the land, to preserve our social custom, to preserve the customs of the inheritance, so far inheritance is concerned. We have got various other customs. We want that the district council should uh, maintain and should, uh, I mean, con preserve it. We should not allow those things to be, uh, uh, to be devalued or to be degraded. We have to retain all these uh, values that we have been having all along. Um, <clears throat> sir, again, it's very insightful to uh, hear all of these thoughts coming from you uh, with respect to your vast experience in this field. So I'll again, I'll sh uh, shoot another question, but before that, I'll just uh, want to ask if there is any question which anyone um, uh, of the participants have. Thank you so much, first of all, for participating. And if you have any questions, it's a very good time. And I would not want to hog all of sir's time right now. All right, so sir, now my next question is a very cliched question. And sir, you will have to understand that, uh, sir, I am a learner and I am here standing before you with folded hands as a student of law. And sir, with that respect, uh, sir, there is this, uh, uh, there is this uh, similarity and <clears throat> this uh, ambiguity between uh, 
so and uh, so between uh, uh, the situation in kashmir in the state of jammu and kashmir uh, so uh, in the union territory so to say right now and uh, so uh, within the northeast and uh, so how uh, it is so so what are your thoughts and your views with respect to the similarities the similarities uh, <clears throat> i welcome that question because uh, well at this stage at this moment i mean some time back i could not uh, elucidly uh, explain our customs our traditions our uh, the manner the the manner of land holding well i have to say this uh, when we go to jammu and kashmir the maharaja then he also signed the instrument of accession and so also the 25 khasi states the chief of the 25 khasi states if you look at uh, once upon a time there was a lecture by a very important personality is that uh, when you when we look at the land tenure system the land tenure system is so unique it is so when we go to jnk and knj the land tenure system in jnk and knj the land tenure system in jammu and kashmir and khasi and jaintia hills is very similar here the land the land does not belong to the state the state of meghalaya do not own land except in certain pockets where either by uh, if it is a reserve forest or by acquisition otherwise the land does not belong to the government there are they are here we have got community land and we have got uh, private land we call it rekinty land these lands belongs to the uh, individual owners when we talk of community land rewrite land that belongs to the community land to the community now the land tenure system in jnk and knj is very similar meaning that the the land tenure system is different from the rest of the country in the rest of the country the lands are state owned but when we come to meghalaya the land belongs to the individual there are no revenue records unlike in the plains so that is the similarity about uh, jnk and knj uh, sir, uh, can, sir can i can i intervene most definitely sir but i would like to most humbly introduce you also so uh, kanta sir this is uh, mr rameshwar singh jamwal sir uh, sir is uh, the sir has been the senior standing counsel for the government of uh, jnk so has been the deputy uh, additional uh, solicitor advocate general uh, for the state as well and uh, sir has some question and i will hand it over to him sir i would like to request you don't ask questions on jammu and kashmir no 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 i'll not i'll not ask i'll not ask uh, uh, since uh, i come from uh, jammu and kashmir uh, there are certain misconceptions misconceptions about the 370 about the sixth schedule about the seventh schedule uh apart from emotionality aspects because <laughs> you said that we want to preserve our culture and our traditions etc each and every state is preserving its uh, culture and uh, that doesn't mean that just by having six schedule or by having uh, autonomy you can preserve your cultures and uh, every 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 community every state is preserving its uh, the question asked by mr sharma was very pertinent as to what are the benefits which must have accrued to the state of meghalaya by having six schedule uh, i don't think uh, that uh, uh, in my state uh, uh, by just having 370 any benefits must have accrued to the state of jammu and kashmir it was just an emotional aspect the people the rulers the they exploited the situation they wanted everything from autonomy to uh, funds of the government of india but they did not want that uh, accounting accountability should be there now the accountability aspect uh, must be addressed whether six schedule is uh, taking care of the accountability aspect then the second aspect is that so many laws are developing now cyber laws the corporate laws 
can can this six schedule or by having just autonomy can 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 you progress in that direction because if you want to exclude all these laws then perhaps no big corporation is going to come to the state of jammu either to the state of jnk or to the state of meghalaya as you said they would come only when all the laws which are applicable to the entire country they become applicable to the each and every part of the country so apart from emotional aspect you must look into you must guide your people and you must have debate whether just by having six schedule you are integrating and uh, with, with the country you are progressing well or not and only when you discuss all these aspects from a different perspective you can progress so this was my just a suggestion no 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 uh, question of uh, uh, comparing it with jnk or meghalaya uh, we we can have discussion this is a age of discussion and we can have discussion on all the pros and cons of all these legislations and uh, and uh, the situations which existed in 1947 may not be existing today so that that aspect also requires to be considered so th- th- this was just a suggestion thank you yeah thank you mr thank you very much for your i mean uh, suggestion yes i do agree that uh, we have to assimilate or go along with the mainstream india and uh, if you look at the six schedule you'll notice that uh, the subjects are very limited there are only few subjects paragraph 3 we read paragraph 3 it's very limited it is uh, tribal centric and uh, so far the central laws are concerned they, they are in fact uh, in force in the state of meghalaya doesn't mean that they are not uh, applicable they are applicable we have got the special law like the arms act pokso protection of children from sexual offences those laws are make applicable in the state of meghalaya we have got various other laws which are applicable in the state of meghalaya we are also aligned with the mainstream india but it doesn't mean that we are isolated or we are living in a cocoon uh, be that of it, it, it may uh, the tribal society the tribal society is a very fragile society the desire of the framers of the constitution is that their society the, the the customs and the traditions contained in this tribal society is must be preserved to that extent but so far other laws are concerned corporate laws or whatever laws you are saying yes they are they are applicable here they are we are uh, i mean uh, it is invoked here but so far the transfer of land is concerned because of the paucity of land these lands are not allowed to be alienated to be transferred to non tribals except by due permission of the state government under the meghalaya land transfer regulation act 1971 and be that of me your suggestion is noted and perhaps we have to continue this discussion in the near future and i want you to also deliberate so far jammu and kashmir is concerned and uh, perhaps we can have a deliberation so far uh, uh, kashi and jatils is concerned we will uh, have a special topic on this issue Yeah. and we can deliver deliver it on the instrument of accession i would like to really go into this subject because the promise that has been guaranteed that must be upheld that must be uphold i i feel that uh, i mean the 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 center must understand our position we are very fragile society one fine day we might be it might disappear we don't want that to happen i mean india has got so many societies so many communities it has got its own way and customs and in other areas uh, it is uh, what do you call it there are so much of influx from across the border we are worried also we are we are sharing a border the longest international border with bangladesh our fear is day to day that uh, the influx from across the border will uh, one day uh, overlap the society that is in existence in meghalaya yes thank you mr jariwal <laughs> so uh, so i think uh, the key take away from uh, this particular conversation is that as you very rightly said before the class itself that uh, we will require multiple sessions to be able to understand uh, 
these particular issues because these are not very uh, mainstream or uh, issues that are directly in the heart of the country. These are actually the uh, borders of the country and these are the places which uh, actually require more and more concentration because uh, very less is known, sir, as you have very rightfully uh, put before. And also, sir, it will be great, I think, probably having an interaction at one point of time uh, between Rameshwar, sir, and you just on this particular issue, probably more deliberation. It will definitely help uh, a lot with respect to people who have limited idea about these, uh, these thoughts. Uh, <clears throat> yes, yes, uh, I do agree that uh, we have to have more deliberations. And uh, it is my request to the rest of the country that uh, they should know their geography very well because uh, they are ready. Uh, the Chief Minister of uh, West Bengal, when there was a question about Shillong, she does not know where is Shillong. Neither she knows where is Meghalaya. Thereafter, she, she mistook uh, Meghalaya sharing border with Pakistan. And uh, I feel that we, may, we need to educate the citizen of this country much more. Uh, we don't want to be alienated uh, in one hand. At the same time, we don't want to be uh, discarded also by the center. Be that as it may, we need to have more deliberations on these issues. And uh, so far, our, our uh, land tenure system, we need to have a special session perhaps on some other occasion. Mr. Sharma. It will be our blessing. It will be our blessing. And I thank you on behalf of the entire family for uh, coming to us uh, and sharing your views, sir. And it's really very humbling. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you.